please welcome Scott and Kimberly. Thanks, Anne, and uh, our thanks to the Commonwealth Club as well for uh, having us here tonight where we are presenting today and rolling out today and releasing today this report that you'll be hearing more about. And I'd like to thank all of you also for being here this evening uh, with us in this, uh, uh, I believe it's SRO is the, uh, is the saying. So we are very glad to have, to have all of you here with us this evening. So as Anne said, we're going to be talking today about the report that we are just releasing, uh, smart, New Visions, Smart Choices, Western Water Security in a Changing Climate. And some of the stories that you're going to be hearing tonight are the stories of 10 communities across the American West that are making smart choices for how their communities and their rivers um, and their lands are going to survive as we go deeper into the time of climate change. So Scott Miller, uh, my colleague here, and I will be um, handing things off as we go through uh, the next 40 minutes or so, and then we're very much looking forward um, to your questions with any luck we will kind of be able to answer. So um, let's start with a story. Um, so the first story that we're just going to put out here real quickly is about innovative partnerships. And you're going to hear a lot about innovative partnerships as a theme that goes through um, our remarks tonight and a theme that goes through the report that we've just uh, released today. Because, you know, the best way to really understand about things is through stories. And that's the way we learn from, uh, from each other as human beings. So we're going to start with a story, as with all of the stories um, in this report today, about what's working. So um, I think most of you recognize this. This is uh, Denver, Colorado, the Rocky Mountains behind it. Rocky Mountains are the, um, the U.S. Forest Service calls them the water towers of the American West. Um, they are the headwaters for seven major rivers um, in the, in the uh, western United States. They're mostly managed by the U.S. Forest Service. And like so many of these forested watersheds, so that's where um, the water obviously for the Front Range comes from and then all the way down to San Diego, all the way down the, Col the Colorado. Um, uh, into uh, Southern California and then um, into, into Mexico, into the, into the Delta. So these forested watersheds that are the heart and soul of these water towers are just, you know, an increasing risk for big catastrophic fires. Um, bark beetles, many of you have heard about bark beetles, have been munching their way through these forests. Um, we're seeing as the climate warms, as the, as the forest gets drier because there's not as much snow, we are seeing increasing um, catastrophic um, fires. Um, and I think we all saw a lot of those last summer, um, you know, in places like Arizona and also in Colorado. But in 2002, which is when this story starts, um, there was a really big fire called the Heyman Fire. And it was actually the biggest fire to hit Colorado. And it's still, uh, to this day, the, the worst fire that's hit, that's hit Colorado. Consumed 138,000 acres. You see some of the headlines up here. Um, uh, they were rather dramatic, but it was also a rather uh, dramatic, um, a dramatic fire. And after this huge fire that swept through all these watersheds that provide water primarily for Denver's Front Range, the rain started, you know, the big summer monsoon rains. And they hit the side of those burned mountains and the mountains started to slide. The mountains started to slide into the rivers um, and into one uh, reservoir in particular that um, the big utility in Denver relied on. Um, and it was a million cubic feet of sediment into that reservoir. And um, actually 12, what, 10, 10 years later, just as an aside, it's cost this water utility $40 million just to treat um, and remove the sediment out of that one reservoir from that one fire. It was a big fire, but it was just one fire. So. Thanks to this fire, I mean, okay, so there's, here's the good news with this big horrific fire, is that this sea change happened. And I don't know if it's quite accurate to say that uh, the U.S. Forest Service, the land managers 
for the forests where this water came from, and the downstream utility, Denver Water, were Hatfields and McCoys, but there is this great story about the former um, head of the utility after this fire walking into his board meeting going, goddamn Forest Service, they can't even manage their own land. So uh, let's put it this way, they didn't get along very well for, uh, with each other uh, for a very, uh, a very long time. But then the Heyman Fire came along and again, this $40 million for getting sediment and treating sediment out of one uh, reservoir. So these two big players, this Hatfield and this McCoy said, you know, I guess we're going to have to sit down and start working together to solve this problem. And so what they did in 2010, so this is, you know, eight years after the fire, so these things do take a while, they formed the Forest to Fawcett Partnership between Denver Water and the Forest Service. $33 million over a five-year period to treat and restore five key watersheds that, it, that are on national forest lands that provide water for, um, uh, for downstream. And, you know, as the, you know, you think about this sea change, you know, the then president of the Denver Water Utility said, you know, we finally realized that water doesn't come out of the stream, it comes out of the forest. So this partnership is the biggest, biggest of its kind in the country. It's already, they've already um, have uh, got 17,000 acres um, of uh, restoration uh, under their belt. And as uh, both the Forest Service and the head of Denver Water are saying, you know, this is only a five-year agreement, but we're obviously going to be keeping it going after this. So that's your, that's your first story. So we want to talk a little bit about why, why water is so important in the American West. Well, water, of course, has always been important, even before we started understanding what was happening uh, to our planet in terms of climate. The West is a naturally dry area, at least most of it outside of a part of the world I come from in Seattle, and even Seattle's pretty darn dry for about mm -hmm. four months out of the year. Um, but now it's even more important and, and, and really, it's part of, I think, what the whole world is going to experience, which is that water is the face of climate change. Water is how most people are going to experience a changing climate. Uh, not always the way we will in the West. Some people will get too much water. Some people will get too little water. Some people will see water coming up over their, over their coastline and causing coastal flooding. Some people will be seeing too little water in the summer, too much water in the winter. But um, it's the way that most people are going to come to understand what climate change means for them in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's critically important because that's how people understand problems, is how they affect them personally. Um, and this is a challenge for a number of reasons. And we're going to talk a lot about optimistically about how challenges are being met. But I think it's important to outline what the challenge is because water is inherently a challenge. Water is a challenge in the West, in particular, because of our laws. Our laws were written, that govern water, were written uh, before the turn of the last century. Um, they were written at a time when the West was being settled. Um, and they're still with us today. And in many cases, those laws are very, very, very uh, awkward and uh, disconnected, really, from the reality of the way water needs to be managed in the 21st century, especially in an era of a warming climate. So the laws are one problem, but not the only one. There's also a disconnect that the public has, especially in the West, where, remember, the West is now the second most urbanized part of, of the United States, second only to the Northeast, and fast catching up. Most people in the West live in cities. And most people who live in cities, honestly, don't know where the hell their water comes from. It comes from their tap. Um, and in some cases, the water doesn't come from all that far away, but it doesn't come from their tap. It may come from a well in the backyard. It may come from a watershed, as in Seattle, about 40, 50 miles away. Or in some cities in the West, it can come from 1,000 miles away. But people have a disconnect from where their water comes from and a lack of understanding of all of the complex infrastructure that is required to get them water. Um, another problem in the West is that there's a perception at any rate in most of the West that there's not enough water. It may or may not be true, it probably isn't. 
if we used water more wisely, uh, all droughts, droughts aside. But the fact is people perceive it that way and there's a long history of fighting tooth and nail mm -hmm. in this region for every last drop uh, that really, really, really can make collaboration difficult. Another challenge with water is that infrastructure, the stuff that, that, that even, even in a watershed that provides water for a city only 40 miles away, like my city in, in, in Seattle, the infrastructure is massively expensive. It's really expensive to move water around, both in terms of what you have to do to move it and then the energy that it requires to power that infrastructure is very, very expensive. But at the same time, water is cheap. Um, you don't see great public uprisings about the cost of their water bill because water in this country is under, probably underpriced. Now, I'm not recommending that we raise the price of water. There's a lot of you know, equity issues that come up with that. But the fact is, is that water in this country is a good deal. It's one of our really good deals. And one final challenge before Kimry gets back into, uh, into how this report came to be was is that um, the natural benefits of, of, of watersheds, the natural benefits of the landscapes that keep our water clean and provide our water have virtually no value on the books. Mm -hmm. uh, San Francisco is a great example. I was just at, a, at another conference um, where the head of the San Francisco water utility was on the, on the panel and he said that his utility owns 80,000 acres in the General Bay Area. 80,000 acres in a place where a sliver of a house costs a million bucks. The value of that 80,000 acres on the books of the, of, the, of the utility is zero because it can't be built on. Yet it's the thing, it's the, it, it is the land that's keeping San Francisco's water safe to drink and providing San Francisco with plentiful water in a lot of ways. So those are the challenges and that's the reason why these stories are so important, because it's easy to get stuck and figure that these challenges are intractable. But what Carpe Diem West has found is that they're not. So, Kim Marie? You know, when we talk about um, water being the um, uh, face of, of climate change, I mean, these are all pictures that we've all seen uh, at, at some point. Um, and, you know, it's pretty horrifying, you know, and you think, oh my gosh, what, what are we going to do? And it's certainly what the media talks about in terms of, you know, it is, uh, you know, it is doom and gloom, climate change, oh my gosh, we are just, uh, we're going to heck in a handbasket. And in Carpe Diem West, we've been working across the American West for over five years now and working with the 10 communities that are highlighted in this report and many other communities, and we said, you know, there's actually some really great work going on in the American West, and we see this because our job is to help these communities collaborate, to build bridges, um, and we've seen the power of people working together. And uh, I'm just going to bring it up again, you know, this, this thing of having um, everybody has one hand on a part of an elephant, and they, cannot, they can only hold on to their part of the elephant. When you bring people together, and you get them off their stuck places. We, we, we like to use really good food. Um, I suppose wine probably helps as well. Uh, but when you get them actually talking with each other, then they can start to see that, oh, there are other parts to this elephant, and this elephant makes up a larger, a larger hole. So that's why we did this report, because we said, you know, these, these 10 communities and other communities like it in the American West aren't sitting around waiting for someone else to do the job or being fatalistic and saying, oh my God, you know, we're just, you know, for, forget it, we'll all move to uh, Seattle, except that doesn't work too well these days either. Um, I've heard Montana mentioned a lot, so we'll all, we'll all, uh, we'll all move to Montana. Um, and, you know, and, and, and we're certainly not going to sit around and wait for the federal government to come up with some solutions. So we're going to start doing them ourselves. So that's what these 10 stories are about. So I'm going to start. Well, what's, what's important about the stories before Kimry mm -hmm. launches into them is that, is that, you know, I'm in the communications business. I'm not in the water business. And we do a lot of communication consulting around climate change because we work on environmental issues and what bigger issue is there environmentally than climate change. And... You know, so I, and I've divided as I've looked at climate communicators into sort of two groups. 
I call them the so's and the so what's. <laughs> and the so's are the ones who want to tell you exactly what's happening and they want to pound it uh, into your head until all shadow of a doubt is removed that climate change is real, which many of us are already there. But it, 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 and, and they feel an obligation to report all of the scientific projections and facts about what's going to happen to us. And I think that's important, don't get me wrong. We need to understand, we need to be making decisions based on science. But, by, but the other group, the so what's, are more concerned about what we're going to do about it. And I think in terms of the public, the so what is really important. Because the so is pretty darn depressing. But the so what, and these are so what stories, the so what is the pathway to saying, but we can still respond. And that's what the power of these stories is about. And that's why it was so important, I think, for Carpe Diem West mm -hmm. to pull them together. Great. So let's tell a few stories. Um, and again, you're going to hear themes going throughout these three stories, and then the one we're going to go and end um, quickly with. So the first one is um, gray Trump, Green Trump's gray. Well, what the heck does that mean? Um, this is a question that's facing so many communities across the West, especially for water utilities as they're, in many cases, 40, 50, 60, 80 year old infrastructure um, starts to age. And as we all know, we all do age and so do concrete pipes. Um, you know, how do we best how do we best plan for our future water supply? And how is it best protected? Is it best protected by gray infrastructure? Let's put in new concrete pipes and new dams. Or can we harness the power of nature to protect and treat water supplies? Um, is, that, is that the better investment? And over the past 100 years, um, Salt Lake City, um, has been um, take has been a real pioneer in this greener approach, and along the way, by their estimates, they have saved their community hundreds of millions of dollars just in capital costs to build a treatment plant. So we'll talk a little bit about how that all plays um, uh, together. So and and then just as a, a a side note, something that Scott pointed out the other day, um, you know. Salt Lake is in Utah, and Utah is kind of a conservative part of the country. Um, and this is not about um, blue versus red. This is one of the more conservative communities in the country that is taking one of the most comprehensive, innovative approaches to protecting their water supply and ensuring that their growing population has clean water to drink. So. Uh, for those of you who have been to Salt Lake, that's of course the Wasatch Front behind. So the famously clean water uh, in Salt Lake comes from this Wasatch Front. And like most um, mountain uh, regions uh, in the American West, you know, historically it's provided this great snowpack, which uh, many of you probably have skied on it, which of course is storage for um, water in uh, the spring and the summer. So you have a warming climate. Um, this snowpack isn't working quite as well and is probably going to work less well as, as we go into the future as precipitation falls more as rain and not as snow and um, spring runoff peaks um, to earlier in the year. So Salt Lake is looking at some possible serious shortages in um, both water supply and water quality problems as it goes, um, it goes ahead in the decades to come. But this is where they're doing things in such a smart way. They've got um, a number of programs that some were launched a decade ago, some were launched decades ago. One of their big issues, in addition to this warming climate and you know less snow up there in those beautiful mountains, is that you know this is all national forest land up here for the most part, and this national forest land has some of the highest recreation uses of any national forest in the country. So it's you know the proverbial being loved to death. Um, that that's that's what's happening up in the Wasatch Unita uh, National National Forest. So they've established a partnership with the Forest Service, where they uh, the city pays back uh, country rangers to protect the watersheds that that Salt Lake's water comes from. They've got you know it's like crazy things like you know like the Forest Service, like all federal agencies, doesn't have too much money these days. So like Salt Lake pays for the bathrooms to be cleaned up in the national uh, up in the national forest. 
They've also implemented a program, you know, set up like most places in the West, there's little inholdings of private land and private property up here. So the water utility and the city have established a um, conservation and land purchase fund that there's a surcharge of $1.50 on your water bill comes out every two months. Um, and that um, surcharge right now is producing about a million and a half dollars every year, which again allows the utility and the city to buy from willing sellers and to also put conservation easements um, on this land. And then the third thing that they're doing is that they have, it's interesting, and this is again a theme that you'll hear throughout this, is you know what these water utilities like to refer to as sensible regulation. They've got extra territorial um, authority for the larger footprint of the city in the valley to make sure that land use regulations are being followed so you're not having horrible stuff getting dumped into storm sewers and um, things like that. And again, the theme um, that we hear here and you'll see through every story in this report is the durable partnerships are essential to this success in Salt Lake. You know, that collaboration is the bread and butter of their work. And without, you know, as we like to say, getting to success by a thousand meetings, um, Salt Lake certainly um, exemplifies that. You know, one thing that we discovered mm -hmm. um, at uh, the, my last job at the Russell Family Foundation, we funded green infrastructure. That's what we did. And uh, we talked with a lot of other people around the country about where were the leaders, where were the Salt Lakes of the world? Because um, there's other cities that are doing a good job of, 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 of looking at natural systems to enhance their infrastructure, which is really what that's about in all sorts of ways. And, you know, some of them were the usual suspects, you know, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, sort of green meccas. But a lot of them aren't. And there's Salt Lake, there's Philadelphia, for example, which is one of the absolute leaders in green infrastructure for stormwater. Um, there's Milwaukee. Up in my region, there's some little sort of blue-collar towns like Puyallup and Bremerton. So we asked ourselves, what, what is it that, that ties these cities together? Why, why are these cities leaders and others aren't? And what we found was, in every single case, it was people in municipal and utility staff that were leading this, and which really underscores the need for this kind of collaboration. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because somebody was getting sued. It wasn't because of sort of outside advocacy. It was because you had engineers and, and, and people within agencies, public utilities and private utilities, who really believed that there were better ways and cheaper ways to do business. And, and moved their own bureaucracies to get there. So I, it, it's, really, so, so it's, it's really important to engage those entities. And, 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 and what we found is to try to support those people who are visionary within their own agencies, which is one of the things that, 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 that happens in virtually all of the stories that Kimberly's going to tell. Great. So let's move on now, um, go a little further north, a little greener part of the world. Um, and uh, that's Eugene, Oregon, and the Mackenzie River. We're going to talk a little bit about healthy water and healthy farms. And this, is, again, is a theme that we're seeing um, throughout the West that Scott's going to touch on a little bit more here in a minute. So we all know the old adage, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And this is what we're seeing in Eugene and the Mackenzie River Valley. Um, so Eugene, uh, about 20,000 folks live in Eugene, and they com depend completely on the Mackenzie River for their drinking water. And the Mackenzie River is this beautiful river that flows out of the Cascades um, in Oregon and then down to the valley below. It's first class, you know, recreation river, fishing river, beautiful, clean, uh, clean, pure water. So you say, so what's the problem? You know, why, why is Eugene even trying to do anything at all? Well, the most, the middle stretch of this river, you know, where it comes down in the mountains and then it gets kind of flat um, uh, before it, you know, starts heading towards Eugene, is um, prime farmland, a um, lot of ranches, a lot of, um, of hazelnut growers, a lot of hazelnut orchards, and a lot of uh, private uh, timber companies. And um, Eugene um, said, you know, 
these, this is the most important part of the river. This is the part that it's the most environmentally um, rich. It's where most of the critters live and most of the fish live. And it's also the place that has the potential for most of the problems in the river to come from. So pollution, pesticides, pesticide runoff, um, sediment loading, um, et cetera. So, they did something pretty smart. They said, you know, if these lands are well stewarded, they're going to provide invaluable insurance. You know, otherwise we'd have to go and again, you know, the proverbial hundreds of millions of dollars in treatment plants that we'd have to go and build. It's going to provide invaluable insurance against flooding, erosion, increased water temperatures, which is a really big deal in the Pacific Northwest because water gets too warm and the fish can't live. Um, and they said, you know, we know climate change is coming, and we know that it's think we're going to see more rain on snow events, so we're going to see big extreme weather events, which is going to cause flooding, which is going to cause big sediment dumps uh, into the river. And we know that we need to do our best that we can now. We need to make those no regrets choices now to protect this river. So about 10 years ago, a little less than 10 years ago, they started this program that's got um, two goals. This is, this is City of Eugene and their water agency. And they said, first of all, we want to make sure that these farms stay um, farming, that they don't get sold off for development and everybody has, you know, their 30 acres and their big ranch house on it. They got, they got to stay in farming. So they've done some really innovative things. Scott's going to touch on one of them here in a minute to um, make, to really build that local market. For, um, for food in Eugene and the surrounding areas. And then the second is that they said, you know, we need to encourage a dramatic reduction in pesticides and nitrates um, on these farms. So they partnered with these farms. So, you know, this, this one guy I talked to who's been hazelnut grower, he's been there for decades and his dad before him growing hazelnuts. By the way, they are not filberts in case you didn't know, they are hazelnuts. Um, he said, you know, we all want clean water and Eugene helps me pay the difference so that I can use, he referred to soft pesticides and lime in my orchards instead of nitrate. Um, uh, he said, I'm happy to work with him and he said, everybody around here feels, uh, pretty much feels the same way. So this is, uh, again, if you look at the costs that have been saved, the money that has been saved, you know, you could say this is the right thing to do, this is the green thing to do, this is the community building thing to do. Well, there's also the hardcore bottom line thing to do, which is right now, um, City of Eugene estimates that they've saved over $100 million, not bad for a city of 200,000 people, um, in reduced costs for chemical treatment, um, dealing with nitrates, dealing with sediment loads. So Eugene, again, you know, we look at them of groups that we work with around the West, again, as another one of these visionary communities that says, okay, we know climate change is coming and we're going to get ready. We're going to build resiliency into our community and into our environment. You know, and the thing about, uh, that I love about the Eugene story is the way they've reached out to the agriculture community. I mean, the fact, the fact of the matter is, is that it's hard to have a conversation about water in the West without including farmers, without including agriculture. Um, I mean, let's just say it, in some parts of the West, farmers use a lot of water. So that's one reason, you know, uh, especially in places where irrigation happens. But it's not the only reason. In urban areas like Eugene, um, if farmers aren't growing crops on their land, that land is going to be growing houses. And in, that's even a bigger potential pollution problem than, 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 than farms. And there's a big incentive to keep land in agriculture to protect water quality if you can incent the farmers to uh, change some of their practices as I've done in Eugene. And the utility has really partnered with farmers there to the, stand, to the point that they're actually helping to sponsor the Eugene farmers market that actually provides mm -hmm. a market for the mm -hmm. crops that then, uh, that are being grown on the land around the town. Eugene is the kind of community that really embraces that kind of uh, eat local uh, ethic. So farmers, really important to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Often hard to get, often hard to do, but really important. So I'm gonna tell one more quick story and um, then we're gonna move, I think, to some uh, questions and we, as I said, we may or may not have any answers, but we'll, we will do our, our darndest. So um, 
last story I want to tell is briefly uh, about uh, San Antone. Uh, many of you will refer to it as San Antonio. If you were down there, it would be San Antone. And, then, and the title of this story, Getting Religion, is um, uh, there for a reason. The um, uh, mayor of uh, Castros um, of uh, San Antone talks about how we all practice conservation in San Antone. Um, we're religious about it. So, hence the name of this story, title of this story, uh, Getting Religion. So, uh, San Antone is the seventh largest city in the United States. Um, it gets most of its water from the Edwards Aquifer, which is this amazing, huge aquifer that I think covers a, most of Northwest um, uh, Texas and seemingly um, uh, inexhaustible supply of, of, of water. Um, San Antonio is certainly um, the envy of many drought ridden cities um, in the United States and primarily um, in the West because, well, gee, you got this aquifer. What's, what's, the, what's the problem? But, you know, San Antonio is that place that, you know, proves, you know, that great conservation maxim of there is never enough water to waste. So about 10 years ago, we, we just, just does seem to be a theme, doesn't it, 10 years ago. So about 10 years ago, actually maybe a little bit longer in San Antonio's case, they said, you know, we got three challenges. Our population is growing by about 20,000 people a year. Um, this aquifer, this bountiful, you know, gorgeous aquifer, if aquifers can be gorgeous, is home to many endangered species and it's highly regulated. And then in San Antonio, like most of Texas, as we all keep reading about, um, they are prone to more frequent and more severe droughts. And despite what the Texas governor says, I think that might be continuing into the future. So in uh, the 90s, they sort of started with the low-hanging fruit that so many of us know about, you know, the um, low-flow toilets and, the, you know, the ads that say, you know, turn your faucet off when you're brushing your teeth and things like that. They said, well, that got us a little bit of the ways, but it didn't get us all of the ways. So they developed, again, what they call their three-legged stool. Again, you'll see this. This is a theme that goes through certainly a place like Salt Lake, uh, for example. Education and outreach, getting religion reasonable regulation, and financial incentives for doing the right thing. And they also expanded out to include water recycling. So they, they like to brag about the purple pipe that they have going around the city. And this recycled water is being used by Microsoft and Toyota, some of the other big businesses um, there um, in the region. One of my favorite quotes out of this report is what their, uh, the water utility CEO says. You know, he says, our business model is to convince our customers to buy less of our product. <laughs> so over the past seven years, that's kind of been working. They have reduced um, uh, use by 42%. They've saved $84 million. And by their estimates, by the water utilities estimates, if they hadn't put these things into place, they would have needed every year an additional 39, wait for it, 39 billion gallons of water a year if they hadn't done, if he, they hadn't done these things. And then my last thing that I'm so, uh, that I'm so fond of San Antonio about, um, and uh, as those of you who have been there, that beautiful river walk, we should all go down there and go walk, go walk along it, is, you know, the, the water conservation director there says, you know, the next frontier for us is uh, landscaping, outdoor landscaping. Most parts in the West, that's 50 to 60 percent of the water consumed residential, residential use. And as you know, in the American West, we kind of like our green lawns. But she said, you know, this is, she said, this is our next job, is to convince people that they can switch to plants and yards that require little water, are drought resistant, and that, yes, by golly, it is the Texan thing to do. You know, and conservation, there's, there's a, a really a wonderful history of conservation in the West um, that's, that, that it doesn't get told enough, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, repeatedly, going back to the 1970s, you know, I mean, before there was any talk about climate change or, you know, a prolonged drought or anything along those lines, utilities have asked their customers in the West to conserve water from time to time. And almost always, almost always customers respond by exceeding those conservation targets and then the water use never goes back up to where it was. 
I mean, we've seen this again and again and again to the point that it's, it's actually in the past created problems for utilities in their budgets. But it's really a success story and it shows you just how a public at changing public attitudes towards water use could be so powerful. And I think that this whole area of, of um, landscaping is really the next frontier. I mean, again, in, in, in my area, um, in, in Seattle, it's very dry in the summer. I mean, you think of Seattle's raining all the time, this time of year does, but it can go months without, the average is half an inch of rain uh, in July and about less than that in August. You know, things get brown up there, you know, if you don't water them. And when I first moved there in the Pacific Northwest in, in, the, er, in the late 70s, everybody had green lawns all summer long. People watered the heck out of them. That's the way you did it. Water's cheap, didn't cost much. Now I can drive through my neighborhood. Water is still not very expensive in Seattle, but I can go through my neighborhood and, you know, you'd see maybe one green lawn a block in the middle of August. It's a big change, and the people sort of look at that green lawn and go, what's, what's the matter with that person, you know? So, 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 so you really can make a difference there. One, one little side note is that not all utilities have taken that approach. There's a city in eastern Washington called Pasco. Does anybody know Pasco? Pasco is essentially in the desert. I mean, it's, um, it's in, in very, very dry part in the Columbia Basin, very, very dry part of the state. And uh, uh, this was a good 20 years ago, but I did a story as a reporter about there was a guy there who was, uh, was a leader, was doing exactly what the mayor of San Antonio wants his people to do, and took out the grass in his parking strip and put in a bunch of cactus and stuff because it didn't require water, desert plants, and he got fined. <laughs> so that just shows that the, the, the utilities in the cities have to change too, and that's happening, but it can really make a difference. You are listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program, Smart Choices, Western Water Security and a Changing Climate, with Scott Miller, CEO of Resource Media, and Kimberly Wiltshire, CEO of Carpe Diem West. We've come to that part of the program where we get to ask our speakers questions, and what I'll do is I'll pass the mic around and do that. I, ha I have a first question, though. I get to have the first question. And I know that about landscapes, but I want to know about golf courses. <laughs> well, you know, as you much to comment about I can <laughs> comment about golf courses, most cities, um, not all, but most cities have done a pretty good job of using recycled water on their golf courses. Now, you could still make all kinds of statements about boy, that's an ugly swath of green in the desert, or gee, that's a lot of swaths of green in the desert. But for the most part, most of them are, are using uh, recycled water. There's also some emerging golf course certification programs for, that have more to do with pesticide use, mm. um, because that's the other problem with golf courses, even in places where there's an adequate water supply, is that many of them use a lot of fertilizer and a lot of pesticides. Um, and there's uh, certification programs out there that golf courses can earn certification saying that they are environmentally friendly, that, um, and you know, those, those kind of certification programs can make a difference over time. As we look at uh, choices in the future, is there any place for desal plants? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question and certainly one that a lot of communities are wrestling with. Um, you know, as you know, there's a number of different challenges with desal plants. Um, there's one that's going in in San Diego, um, and uh, it's going to be using a lot of energy. It's going to be putting a lot of brine um, water out into the bay. There's also the argument that can be made that it uses even more energy to pump water um, up over the Tehachapi's into Southern California than does a desal plant. I do know that the state of California, State Water Resources Control Board, and the state and the and the Coastal Commission and one other agency are going to be coming out with joint, um, not a certification program, but regulations um, next year that are going to set a standard for desal plants, at least in California. And, you know, as a matter of principle, um, you know, the, 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 the challenges posed by climate change are very, very complicated. And, the, you know, you're not going to, you're, you're, you're certainly not going to see you know, natural systems, being able to cope with all the human needs. The issue is to balance and to really be able to understand the power of natural systems. Um, but, but clearly, you know, there's going to be some technological fixes that are going to 
be needed to help us through what we're facing over the next mm -hmm. 100 years or so. Um, have you come across uh, any communities that are using recycled water that have also um, come up with solutions for dealing with pollutants of emerging concern, like uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products? Could you, could you repeat that question just a little louder? Yeah. Um, Communities that are using recycled water, uh -huh. have you seen any of those communities come up with uh, solutions for pollutants of, of um, emerging concern, like uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably two issues there. You know, the first issue is not putting the stuff in the water to begin with, like don't put your your drugs down your toilet. But I think the other um, issue is for treatment. And I know that there's, you know, really good technology now. It's a little pricey, price is coming down, but that, you know, filters out that, um, that gunk. There's also regulatory barriers, you know, that, um, because sometimes um, municipalities just want to use that recycled water to flush toilets. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't clean up the whole loop and the system, but that's, you know, that's not a consumptive use. And I know up in, up in the Pacific Northwest, they have standards for, I mean, there's one, one, one story over in Bainbridge Island, which is across from Seattle. One of the first living machines, are you familiar with living machines? It's, a, it's basically what you can build a, a, a lot, it's a, a, a greenhouse. That you that is built mainly as demonstration projects, but I think they're becoming more and more common as functional as functional um, uh, water filters. And this is an environmental camp that you know doesn't use a huge amount of water, and they built a living machine that treats all of the wastewater on site to a standard that's close to drinking water standards. But you would you know nobody's proposing that you drink it. I mean that would be you know heretical in, in terms of the Safe Drinking Water Act and the like. But, they, the, the, but the fact is, they can't even use it to flush their toilets. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because, and I hope this isn't too graphic, because there's a color standard um, for wastewater. And the water that comes out of this living machine is naturally tinted a little bit brown because of tannin in the soil. It's got nothing to do with anything that's in the water. It's just in the dirt. And they can't use it. They can't use it. So, I mean, I think along with the need to treat water more effectively in order to reuse it, there's also a, a, a need to look at the regulations that govern the reuse of water, mm. because um, in many cases, we're not making the best use of scarce resources, so. I've seen a lot of really great success stories in small-scale collaboration partnerships, but not as many amazing stories in very large, complicated watershed issues. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how our federal institutions can work a little bit better because we do have, for example, the Bureau of Reclamation that uh, maybe isn't working so nicely with the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, U.S. Forest Service has done a really nice job. I've seen it change over the last decade in getting more involved. So if you could have a comment or a statement around that, that would be great. You know, I think uh, one of our colleagues counted up that there's uh, 24 federal agencies that deal with uh, water issues in the United States. So there's a lot of them out there. They have overlapping jurisdictions. They are sometimes at cross purposes with each other. Um, they, uh, you know, maybe just because that's, you know, that's the jurisdiction, that's, that's the regulation. So I think that collaboration and good collaboration is going to need to be modeled by communities and it's going to need to be pushed up to that federal, um, to that federal level of work. Yeah, there was a, there was a, a, a politician from uh, the Pacific Northwest who also served in the federal government named Ron Sims, who's also been a big supporter of Carpe Diem West one of my favorite political leaders, he was a county executive in King County, where I live, and um, he moved up to one of the top posts in housing and urban development. And I saw him give a speech once where, and this guy's been in government most of his career, you know, and, and believes in government and has worked at both the local and the federal level. And he told a bunch of, um, in this case it was an environmental funders, that like it or not, the federal government are, is, is a lousy innovator, but they're great implementers. 
And what he was trying to say was, don't look to the federal government to come up with the creative solutions. Look to the federal government to take your creative solution and bring it to scale. And so, and, and that's something we hear again and again and again, is that especially now with the, you know, things aren't so healthy in the federal government for a lot of reasons, you know, partisan bickering and, and, and budget problems, it's really important to craft local solutions think locally, and then bring them to the federal government. The federal government's looking for easy things to adopt. You know, they're not looking, it, it, it's tough for the federal government to be creative right now. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I've, heard, uh, I've heard a lot about the water utilities not having the ability to effectively monitor the amount of water losses, like line losses that they have um, throughout the system. And, and when I heard the percentage, it was something very shocking to me. Uh, I can't, I, it was to the magnitude of like 25% or something just crazy that blew my mind. Um, and the, uh, the savings that would occur if the water utilities were to uh, find a better way of monitoring the, the pipes and have new, potentially new infrastructure and that sort of thing. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. I know that utilities are, are very old and slow to implement things, but it seems like there's a big potential for, for change and innovation here. You know, I think a couple of things. You know, with Western Water, you know, like I was giving that 39 billion gallons of water statistic, you know, I, I think it's important to put things in perspective, certainly in the American West, where about 80 to 85 percent of water in the American West is used to grow crops. And so that leaves about, yeah, I don't know, 10% for urban areas and about 5% uh, for industrial use. There are certainly a lot of places in the West, and I think even more so back on the East Coast, that have this aging infrastructure. And um, so, yeah, their pipes are leaking. Two reasons, I mean, that, that are going on to answer your question. One is, yeah, their infrastructure is getting old and it's leaking. But the second reason is that, you know, historically the water's been so cheap, so who the heck cares if some of it leaks? Um, so it'd be interesting, I don't know the exact number that you're referring to, but it would be interesting to look at that in terms of east versus west, in terms of the age of infrastructure, but to also look at it in terms of, you know, the overall water consumption use in the American West. You know, it's, it's part of the, I mean, look, the infrastructure issue in this country is massive. And I think it's one of the areas where you get even a public that is a little bit, a little bit, a lot distrustful of government these days. It's one of the things they still expect government to do for them. Um, and so you've identified a really big problem. There's a lot of utilities that have really serious infrastructure problems and don't have a way to pay for the fix. Mm -hmm. One little interesting tidbit, though, that I just heard last week is that it goes the it, it goes the other way with wastewater pipes. So, because so part of the problem, I mean, look, drinking water, you got to deliver it pipes. I don't know another way to do it. I mean, I, the, but wastewater, you don't have to take away in pipes. There are other ways to, to deal with it. And that same line loss, the same leaky pipe syndrome that you talk about with drinking water, it, it works the other way with wastewater in the sense that groundwater is leaking into stormwater pipes. And it's actually dewatering places. It's reducing the amount of groundwater. Uh, causing, causing subsidence and causing mm -hmm. wells to grow go dry. And in the case of wastewater, there actually are alternatives to building big pipes. Um, but so just a little anecdote there. Yes, thank you. In terms of the, our choices in food, what is the proportionate usage or need for water to create, say, a pound of beef, a pound of poultry, and a pound of fish? You know, I think there's people in this room and certainly water experts that can answer the, that question much better than I can or I think Scott can in terms of, I think what you're referring to is the water footprint that is in certain food, is in all food, and is as in all products. But I, I think that you raise a good point in that, again, as we go deeper into the time of climate change and we're going to have uh, water showing up in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong quantity and in the wrong quality, you know, we're going to have to think through, all communities in the West are going to have to think through what kind of choices they want to make. Hi, 
Um, I wanted to thank you for giving us a little bit of good news when we really need it. And these are some really um, promising developments. Mm -hmm. um, here in California, there's a big push to spend, I th I'm not sure how many billions, but perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to put in some tunnels to move water from the north to the south. And I'm wondering if you can foresee um, perhaps investing that money in other solutions, perhaps on a more statewide or local level. Um, do you see uh, possibilities for that, and how can, how can we envision that happening? Um, you know, when we started Carpe Diem West about five years ago, you know, we said, okay, we're going to be dealing with some really tough, contentious issues in the American West, and let's just stay away from um, California Bay Delta issues, because those are the <laughs> hardest ones, hardest ones out there. But to your question, I can't remember the numbers either. I don't know. Uh, we've oh, 40, 40 million, billion, 40 billion dollars. So the concern of so many water users in the South is that in the time of climate change, and especially as the Colorado River continues to go through all of its problems, they want water security. They want water certainty. So the question that, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing we do. It's like, it's, let's get people in the room together. You know, this has been done quite a few times in the Bay Delta. But to your question, do you invest $40 billion in building new infrastructure, new pipes, new canals, et cetera, or do you invest it in, um, in, 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 in do you harness the power of nature? Um, do you, um, you know, get the forests a lot, you know, more resilient? Do you do groundwater recharge? Do you, I mean, the list could go on and on. So you're going to pay 40, you know, 40 billion. Um, it's going to be a lot of jobs, and it's going to be either a lot of jobs building a lot of concrete, or it's going to be a lot of jobs um, uh, restoring and protecting the natural environment. Hi, I'm a hydrologist. Uh uh, water engineer. Good, you can answer those questions so, then. So I, uh, I disagree with a lot of what, what you said. I just thought I'd comment a bit. It's true that in the West, most of our water is used for irrigation. But as a nation, that has long ceased. Most of the water in the country is used to cool power plants. And most of our power plants are used to pump water. It's a national, national thing. Now, if we want a population of a few million people in the United States, we can do the things you say. But if we want a population of a few hundred million people, we really need big infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I'm on the faculty of the University of Arizona. I work mostly in arid lands in, a, in Asia and the Middle East, so forth. We're really stuck. We don't have a lot of options with water supply. Yes, we do conservation and outreach, and we've got people to reduce their per capita use. And we control water uses somehow by pricing. You know, if the price is right, people conserve. But ultimately, we do a lot of wastewater reuse for irrigating golf courses and parks and green strips and, and agriculture uh, and groundwater recharge, of course, whenever there is. So my question is, <laughs> okay, uh, the two things that we do, and I wonder if it applies to your vision, is we're looking very seriously at uh, desalination of water from the Gulf of Mexico to come up to Phoenix and also recharging the Colorado through Canada. Uh, so we get more water in the system. Now, if you looked at any of these two big, really big, big engineering structures to recharge water from Canadian surplus to get water into the Colorado Basin, and then the other one that would help us real big is desalination coming up through uh, the Gulf of California, Sea Cortez. Thank you. So, you know, our vision at Carpe Diem West is that there is a political center of smart, um, Western water leaders and community leaders who are informed by the best science um, out there who are helping build this next vision for what the American West looks like in the time of climate change. So I can't speak to your question. We don't have a position um, on things. Our job, again, is to provide um, a table for people to talk and to say, you know, this is the deal. Climate change is the game changer. And um, the way that we used to do things in the past, the way we used to work with each other in balkanized and siloed and competitive ways isn't going to work. That's the great news about climate change. You know, and, and the other thing is I want to make clear, it's not a question of do we need infrastructure projects or not, or do we need engineered infrastructure or not. We need both. 
I mean, our water system is a, is, is a, a miracle of engineering. And there's going to be, with, now I'm not in a position to decide what macro engineering projects, mm -hmm. you know, we need in the future and which ones we don't. That's not, that's not what I, you know, again, we don't have, I don't have a position on it, you know. I, um, but I, I, can, I can tell you that there are, there, there is, is definitely going to be a role for, uh, for en engineered solutions in the traditional sense. And there's definitely going to be a role for engineered systems that use that replicate natural systems. Mm -hmm. They're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and the key element is, as Kimry said, is that people just need to put it on the table and talk to one another rather than be sort of in a defensive posture and fighting from, mm. from, from very balkanized positions, which happens a lot with water. I hear you say you divide people into so's and so what's. The so what people are people like a teenager. It's not my problem. I can't do anything about it. So well, why should I care? And how do you inculcate that caring that would unite us to work on this problem in a collaborative way? It's a good question. And, and what, let me clarify by what I mean by so what. I don't mean so what like we don't care. I mean, so what is, so what can I do about it? Um, and I think that the, the so what that you refer to, the like, throw up your hands, and it's not just young people, I think it's, you know, people of all ages, comes when the sort of oppressive science of what's happening to us isn't accompanied with some sort of solution, some sort of way for people to engage, like the stories that Kimmery told. And I, I think that that's disheartening for everybody. Um, when when you hear about a problem and nobody offers you a hope that anything can be solved or that you can play a role in solving it, it's it's I think it's human nature to say, I'm just going to worry about feeding my kid, or I'm going to worry about going to work or getting up in the morning because I can't do anything about that. People have to feel like they can do something about it. That's really really important, and it's really easy to get discouraged if you just read scientific projections on climate change. I'd like to hear a little bit more on the so side of the problem as far as water. Where are the real problem spots? What are we anticipating with climate change? And in other parts of climate change, uh, you have to mitigate. You can't adapt to sea level rising very well. But maybe with water you can afford or not. I'd like to hear something along those lines. Thanks. Well, I'll talk about mitigation and, and adjusting to climate change. I mean, because it's been a big debate within the environmental community for a long time. And I'll give you sort of a 35,000 foot answer, which may not be completely satisfactory. But so for a long time, the, the people who were advocating for some action on climate change would look at re mitigation means reducing carbon pollution. So reducing carbon is here. And responding to climate change, responding to the impacts of climate change, is here. And never the twain shall meet. Um, and early on, advocates, this wasn't something I backed, but advocates didn't even want to talk about what you did about climate change because they felt like it would reduce the energy around the very, very real need to actually reduce the amount of carbon we're putting in the air. But in point of fact, the, the circles aren't like this. They're like this. They're not completely overlapping, but they, but, they, but they look like this. And I think that the, one, of the, one of the things that we need to do right, right away is figure out what is that overlap? What are the things that we can do to respond to climate change that will make people feel either, either safer or that they have enough water or what, whatever it is, and probably got something to do with water, that also help to put less carbon in the air? And that's one of the things that many of these stories we didn't get into because that's not the primary focus of Carpe Diem, but a lot of these solutions, and again, they're not the whole story here. I wanna, nobody's saying that, but a lot of these solutions do both. They do both. I mean, when you keep farmland in production um, and you can do it in a way that maintains water quality like they are in the Mackenzie River, that has a positive impact on carbon, has a positive impact on, on responding to the challenges mm -hmm. of climate change. Mm -hmm. 